Nordstrom store employee store manager, and is the only Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. I know we're still eating, so uh, hopefully you can bear with me a little bit because there will be a few things I'll ask you to do in a little bit, but you can go ahead and finish your lunch. But I would like to ask and start out with how many people here by show of hands have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? It's about 80, 90 percent. I was telling, uh, I believe it was Aaron earlier, that I speak all the way from teachers or, excuse me, students in schools all the way up to uh, retirement homes. And it goes anywhere from about 50% up to about 90%, sometimes even higher, that people have suffered something. So I want to tell you very briefly about my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked over in bed and I couldn't find my wife. And I thought, that's very bizarre. Normally Dana would be there. And as I got up to go find her, my little four-year-old Connor comes out and goes, where's mom? I said, I don't know, let's see if we can find her. So we walk down the hall and my 14-year-old son, Kyle, walks out, same question, we don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms and we walk over to where we can see downstairs and here's Dana down in front of the washer and dryer and she's face down and she's all crumpled over. And I knew something was wrong, so we rush down there and I turn her over and there's stuff coming out of her mouth and things and Connor starts crying, what's wrong with mommy? And I said, Kyle, go call the police and fire. So within a matter of five or six minutes, our house had probably 20 or 25 people in it. And they took Dana and they had these paddles and all these electric wires or the, the uh, tubes and so forth and they were doing the, the shock thing. And for those of you that have been through something like this, unfortunately, one of the things that you'll notice is that time loses all measure. And I wasn't sure how much time had gone by and this little fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for 90 minutes. We still don't have a heartbeat. Do you want us to continue? And I remember just sitting there thinking, when you're in shock, your brain still seems to work a little bit. And I thought, 90 minutes, no heartbeat. And I said, um, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38 years old. And as I mentioned, my sons were 4 and 14 at the time. And what it had made it so challenging for me is the fact that this wasn't the first major significant loss that I had suffered. My folks had both died. My father had committed suicide. My mother died of cancer. A couple of my buddies died the night that I graduated from high school back at Queen Anne when it was still around. And I really realized I'm going to have to figure out something to get through life. I was talking to, I think it was Judy Parsons, about seniors. And how do we cope when we get to later on in life? And how are you going to deal with these different things and all these ups and downs of life? I did a commencement speech, quite a different speech, last week at Kamiak High School. And I talked about life is like this. This is what's fun. This is not fun. This is where everybody wants to be again. But this is where the lessons are learned down here. And they're tough, tough lessons. So. I think it occurred to me at some point, it depends on how you look at things. So I apologize. I know you're all eating, but I'd like you to all stand up if you would for a second. Sorry, I know you're right in the middle of the, of the entrees. And I just want you to take your right hand and I want you just to turn it in a clockwise manner. Now there's a clock, if anybody's not sure. <laughs> this is a digital world, you know, here's a watch. Just turn it in a clockwise manner and just kind of stretch out. Feels good, everybody having a little lunch. And then just keep it going clockwise. Now start bringing it slowly down. Keep it going clockwise, back to your eyes, nose, chin, chest, and your waist. Now what direction is it going? Counterclockwise. Thank you, Judy. Counterclockwise, okay, you can sit down. Back to your lunches, wow. thank you. So I have these, there's, <laughs> there's all, that's my favorite part of the meeting, there's always a few people going like, what the heck just happened? I have these fraternity brothers that uh, we still see each other after 45 years and I saw them recently and they go, you know, we've seen your little talk, we're not that impressed. And, um, but then one of them said to me, so what's the story with the circle thing? 
And I go, you're the MBA. You're the one with all the education, the PhD, whatever he had. But it's simply my way of saying it depends on how you look at something. And I think that through the, the loss of Dana, she had died of a prescription pill overdose. She got hooked on uh, Vicodin and all this crazy stuff. And as I mentioned, she was only 38. But I realized that you have to at some point find a tool or tools. The Brooker, that gratitude guy, you can imagine what the tool is for me. It's gratitude. But it, a lot of it had to do with how you look at things, as I just mentioned on that uh, example. So I want to do something. When somebody said to me at some point, which I'll get to in a bit, you need to get a gratitude journal. But I realized that what is gratitude? Gratitude is appreciating what you have versus what you don't have. It's framing your life around the things you're appreciative of and thankful for and so forth. So I'm really sorry to do this again, but there's little three by five cards. I just want to do a little exercise. There's little three, you guys can eat after we're done with this too. I'd like you to grab a three by five card and get a pen. And if anybody doesn't have pens, raise your hand. I have extra pens. This will just take a little bit. And you need to get a partner, so you need to pair up with somebody. If you have to move tables, I see three over there. Just one partner, just two of you together. Anybody else need pens? Okay. And here's what I want you to do. There you go, Judy. Those of you that are faster than others, pen. I want you to write in the upper left-hand corner, I see you as. Just write, I see you as. And to the right of that, I want you to write your partner's name. So if it's Aaron, she's going to write, I see you as Dale. Okay, and then down in the bottom, somewhere along the bottom, either sign or write your name. So we know who, uh, who did this. Okay, and here's what I want you to do. Again, I apologize for cutting into lunch. This won't take long. <laughs> you got so I see you as at the top, your partner's name, and at the bottom, your name. Now I'm going to give you 60 seconds and here's what I'd like you to do. Whether you know your partner or not, whether you've ever met them before or not, I want you to write what you think of them when you see them. I see you as energetic, happy, successful, whatever. 60 seconds, write down everything you think about your partner, go. <laughs> You don't have any properties. You don't have enough room. Don't have enough room. It's funny. <laughs> Do you guys get it? You're writing about your partner. Oh, do you not have? This is this is the partner up here. Whoever that is, your name's at the bottom, and you just write what you think of them when you see them. Okay, he just needs to get up. Okay, you got one. Good. About ten seconds. Okay, and stop. Now what I'd like you to do, I'll give you about another 30, 60 seconds. I'd like you to look at your partner and read to each other what you wrote about each other. <laughs> Okay, and stop. So I want to uh, pick on a couple people, if that's the right word. So Dale, what did you write about Aaron? Aaron is trustworthy, loyal, friendly, courteous, kind of obedient. I should have known to pick on an officer of the law. 
And Aaron, what did you write about Dale? Oh, I said outgoing, friendly, family-oriented, thoughtful, conscientious, and considerate. That's all. <laughs> you only had, there was only 60 yeah. seconds. Okay, give your other partner your, the card that you wrote about them. So they have the one that you wrote about them. The whole point of this exercise is when you see that written down, when somebody says, I see you as energetic, excited, you know, great attitude, energized, all these different things, that's what one of the examples of what gratitude will do for you. I was talking to somebody earlier, I think it was Sharon, about there's so many people who just have this negative attitude about things. And when somebody says, I've done this exercise with large groups, and the person doesn't even know the person. They just happen to get paired up with them because they were sitting together. You'd be amazed how often they nail them. And I tell people, you're going to hold on to those cards? And most people go, yeah. Well, that's what embracing gratitude does. Now, I will tell you, by the average age of this group, we're right in my wheelhouse here. I tried this in schools, and I don't do it in schools anymore because they'd write, I see you as an idiot. And I'd go, no, no, don't be a typical kid. You're supposed to see the positives and things. So it was all about embracing gratitude because otherwise, because of that and the gratitude journal and some different things, I don't think I'd still be here after all the death and all the loss that I had to deal with especially Dana, but my mom and dad and so forth. So I realized once I understood about gratitude, the next thing was is you, you don't have to, but it's nice if you take an attitude as it takes as long as, as long as it takes and don't ever, ever, ever give up. When I went to this um, commencement speech, I told him four words, be grateful and never quit. That's what I learned at 64 that I would have liked to have known at 18. And so I realized all these examples of Sylvester Stallone, tons of banks to get his financing for Rocky. Walt Disney wouldn't have had Walt Disneyland, or Disneyland, I should say, if he hadn't been persistent. And there's all these examples of people that never gave up, and yet people give up all the time. I don't think Dana meant to overdose, but in a, in a way, she kind of gave up. And that left me with two young boys that just had a father and no mother. And I thought, well, I'm going to find some tools to deal with this because of that up and down cycle that I talked about. So I kept saying to Connor, now this is a chamber of commerce. I'm going to talk a little bit later about managing people. I managed up to five or 600 people in a Nordstrom store. And if you understand gratitude, you'll be a better manager. I never started a sentence without something to the effect of, Dale, will you do me a favor? When we get done, can you put those brochures away? I don't care if I was store manager in the big mucky muck. It made no difference to me. And I got a lot of awards and all this kind of thing, and I was just doing the golden rule. But as I watched Connor and Kyle raising children, how many people here have children? Again, pretty significant chunk. To me, raising children and managing people are very similar in the sense that I think the number one trait you need to have is the example you set. You can sit there all day long and do like this. So I better not catch you smoking, but they watch you, whatever the example is. So here's Connor, who's four years old, and they tell me he needs assessments in school. We need to check him out. He's got a problem. I said, his mother just died six months ago. Oh, but we need, to, we need to check him out. He's way behind. So I had to be the best dad possible. I had to be the dad and the mom. So I took him in and we went through all these tests and they had this big thing and I had to hold him back in first grade. And it was just terrible. And they said, well, you know, he's never going to amount to much of anything. I went, really? And he went, yeah, we'll give him all these uh, individual education, IEP, whatever the acronyms were. And they said, he's not going to make it in sports either. And I was a pretty decent athlete. He wanted to play sports, but... He was just set on playing baseball. So I had to be the good dad. Kyle was a good baseball player. So here's Connor at five, and he's playing t-ball. Now, again, for those of you parents, or you maybe don't have to be a parent. When they hit the t-ball, the ball doesn't move. It just sits on the tee. How hard can it be to hit a ball on a tee? And here's he's swinging. Connor just swinging away up here like this. I go, Connor, the ball is down here. What, Dad? And so he finally, he finally lowers it. Come on, Connor, that's how it's played. He hits the tee, the actual plastic tee, the ball dribbles forward, he goes, Dad, I got a hit. I go, Connor, the idea is to hit the ball, not the tee. But he sticks with it. He sticks with it over year after year after year, and frankly, he wasn't a very good athlete. And I thought, maybe those people are right. Maybe I'm Mr. Positive here, Mr. Gratitude guy should just give up. But he kept trying, and we got to May 31st, 2005. He was about 11 years old. Five or six years of doing this. Never played. Couldn't run. Couldn't hit. Couldn't catch. Couldn't throw. Other than that, he's decent. <laughs> so we're in a game, and it's the bottom of the seven, and seven to six, the other team, and, and there's two guys out, and there's a guy in second and third. And I think the coach is probably out of players, 
because I look over, I went to all the games and practices, I look over and guess who comes out of the, the dugout swinging his bat like he's Babe Ruth. And the first mistake he makes is, Dad, I'm up! And he's like waving to me. No, kids never acknowledge their parents. You're supposed to be there, but they don't want to know you're there. So he gets up and, and it's ball one, strike one, ball two. It's full count. The next pitch comes sailing in. He just rips it down the third baseline. Goes just inside the bag. So the guy from third comes in. The guy from second rounds third, he comes in. Here comes the ball. The catcher, the guy, the ball, bam, they catches it. He crashes the plate. The ball pops out. And they win eight to seven. And he's sitting by himself on second base, way out there. Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> Just like Tebow. The entire dugout walks out to second base, puts them on their shoulders, and carries them off the field. And even to this day, that's uh, nine, ten years ago, it's still difficult for me to tell that story without getting choked up because Connor never did give up. And he went on and he finished in Bothell High School, 3.5 average, and he played baseball. He was the leadoff hitter, hitting over 350. And now he's in college, it's a small picture, but he's in college down in San Diego, working for Costco full time, and going to school with a 3.5 average. And he was told he'd never make it. And I'm sure every one of you, I feel very blessed to be up here telling these stories. I'm sure there's many stories like that that you have in your life. But I try to tell people, you just cannot give up. What were those four words I said to those students? Be grateful and never quit. People quit all the time. A few inches short of the vein of gold, there's all sorts of examples. So I just encourage people, embrace gratitude. Don't ever, ever, ever give up, Winston Churchill. And understand that it takes as long as it takes. I was telling somebody, I think it might have been Aaron or Judy, I forget, maybe Sharon. I don't care for PowerPoint because people are always going like, and, they, and it doesn't work sometimes. And I'm, in, I'm where you guys are and I want to, can I just get the PDF? I mean, you're just reading what's on the deal here, if you don't mind. And, and I like to look at people's eyes and see people and tell them it's your journey. I don't care how old you are. It makes no difference. I'm 64 and God willing, I'm going to do this to 74, 84, 94. I mentioned that again, I keep forgetting how I talked to this morning, but I do two or three of these a week. It's the best thing I've ever done. Best thing. Managing those big Nordstrom stores, going to the owner's box, flying in the corporate jets, whatever. That doesn't mean anything to me. I get to actually impact people's life. I impact one life today. One. It was one, one more than yesterday. But there's just a couple of simple principles that I think you have to remember. And the next one after it takes as long as it takes is you've got to make room for gratitude. You've got to get rid of junk in your brain. I'm amazed how many people keep junk in their brain. I get to do these workshops and I do more exercises out here, do a couple of neat ones about getting rid of the crap. You've seen it, you go into the, uh, the uh, cul-de-sac and here's a garage which I believe is designed for a car and the garage door is up and it's just boxes floor to ceiling and then there's a thing like this in the center and you can just see the person going like this to get a box in the back. Well, metaphorically of course, but when you guys go out to your cars today, notice that the windshield is about this deep, it's about two feet deep, and it's about four or five feet wide. It's pretty good size. Now notice how big the rear view mirror is. It's pretty small. It's probably 200 to one ratio. Mostly you want to pay attention to what's in front of you, what's coming again. I could care less what your age is. It makes no, no difference. What's important is out front. Learn a little bit from the rear view mirror. If you see flashing blue lights, Dale, <laughs> You do need to pull over. We don't want to get in trouble here. But it's just, it's so important. And I did, I do remember this was Aaron that I mentioned to this. And this is some of these things I talk about. Embracing gratitude. Don't ever give up. It takes as long as it takes. Make room for gratitude. It is a choice. I tell you, I've gotten better and better at staying away from people that are, woe is me. And happiness is a choice. It's a choice. You can make a decision to go left or right. And that's why I like that windshield because I'll be doing workshops and somebody raise a hand. I've had it with that blah, blah, blah ex-husband of mine. And I go, oh boy, he ruined my life. And I go, okay, so when did you get divorced? Uh, 1993. <laughs> okay, so you're still blaming him 20 years later. So that's the reason. You got to accept responsibility. And when you do that, it is amazing 
what will happen when you understand if you get rid of this junk. People will drive over junk, back to my automobile analogy, pick it up, put it in front of them, and drive over it again. I just don't understand it. This thing, this life thing goes by so fast. John Lennon was five years old when his mother said, I'm going to tell you the most important thing I'm ever going to tell you. John Lennon said, what's that? And he goes, the most important thing you want to find in this life is happiness, is to be happy. So some years later, John Lennon's in school, and he's going, they're going around the room, and the teacher says, John, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he goes, happy. And the teacher looks at John Lennon and says, you don't understand the assignment. Typical John Lennon looks back at the teacher and says, you don't understand life. <laughs> I think you had a D in that class, no? But it really does come down to how you look at something. So after these same fraternity brothers that kind of chuckled and said, well, what's happening? You're just not the same, Dave. I wasn't the same for four or five years after Dana died. One of them said to me one day, you need to get a gratitude journal. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Well, it's a few more than I It isn't usually very many. And I, I had not heard of one. I've heard of a journal, I've heard of a diary and all this kind of thing. So I got a gratitude journal and I started writing. This is the one that I have, but this is long before I did this one. And I started writing it all the time. And what writing in a gratitude journal is, this takes five minutes a day. Not six, not 10, not 20 minutes, less than eight minute abs, all that stuff. Five minutes. And what you do is you write about what you're grateful for. What a surprise. So using mine as an example, Gratitude today is what you're grateful for today. The day and the date and the daily number I'll come back to in a second. Special occasions or current events is just so you don't have to have a diary or journal also. You just need one book. This is what you're grateful for. Here's the highlight of your day. And on the right hand side is what's known as your gratitude intentions or gratitude tomorrow. Your prefrontal cortex houses your subconscious mind. It cannot tell the difference between what you think is going to happen and what actually happens. I write on this site all the time. I'm grateful when I got a chance to speak with Bill Gates' dad and speak to 10,000 people at a big arena and all these things and then it happens. It's amazing and people look at me and like, okay, Mr. Woo Woo. It, it works because you can program your brain. So here's what I'd like you to do. The daily number. Take the same card that you got and I'd like you to flip it over. Keep the one that the person wrote all the nice things about you. And the daily number is this. 10 is one of the best days of your life and 1 is one of the worst. And so every day, and I don't, want, don't write anything yet, but just think about this for a second. I want you to think about what your daily number is right now. And it's, of course it's sunny out, which always helps, but I just want you to think about what your number is. Again, 10, one of the best days of your life, 1, one of the worst. So before you write anything, I want to sort of poll the audience here. If you're between a 1 and a 5, I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But how many people here are a 6? Okay, no 6s. 7s. Pretty good chunk, okay? 8s. Wow, almost as many. Great. 9s. 1, 2, and any 10s. Okay, perfect. So here's what I want you to do on the other side of the card. Now, don't be looking at your neighbor. This is just you and the card. <laughs> like his high school students, they're always texting. What are you writing? Hey! This is your exercise, it's not your friend. So I want you to write on the back of that card what's the number one thing you're most grateful for. It could be one thing, it could be a sentence, it could be a person. Don't show your neighbors, just you and the card. Number one thing, if you could pick just one thing you're grateful for, what would that be? Can you write that down? Whatever you are most grateful for. It could be a word, sentence, anything. And for those of you that are fast, the second thing is the second thing you're most grateful for. Write that down. And the third and final thing is, this might require a sentence or whatever, it's now 12.30 or so, so let's go with yesterday. What was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? I'll give you a second or so to think about it. If you had to think of all day yesterday, I love this table over here. This is my favorite table over here. It's the ambassadors. <laughs> Tremendous energy over there. I'm coming to see all you guys later. Okay, so to review, I want you to now read back, again, just you and the card, not your neighbor, <coughs> table seven in the back. I want you to read what you're the most grateful for, what you're the second most grateful for, and what the highlight of your day was. 
and I want to see, just read it and look at it and see if that changes your thought pattern about this daily number. Okay, so again, if you're a 1 to a 5, I don't want you to raise your, actually 1 to a 6, because there are no 6s. After doing that, writing that down, how many people are a 7? Okay, couple. 8s. Okay, thank you, great, thank you. 9s. Few more nines and any tens? Absolutely. Aaron, Judy, perfect. Depends on the size of the group. I'd sometimes spend more time on that, but the whole idea is when you frame what the highlight of your day, I'll ask people later. It's very private to me. It's nobody's business except theirs. Sometimes it's seeing a grandchild, sometimes it's getting together and having a glass of wine or their husband or wife or taking a walk or seeing a sunny day, whatever it is. But the whole idea is that it has to do with framing what you have versus what you don't have. And then one of the things in the top of this journal, and I do sell these by the way, but if you want to buy a journal, they're $15, it's fine, but if you want to get a spiral notebook, I'm fine with that too. But in the top it says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you, but if you write about it, it empowers you. There's something about writing that starts with the thought up here in your brain, the old CPU up here, goes to your heart, your arm, your hand, the pen, and the paper. And when you write it down, I'm so grateful for the conversation I had with Judy Parsons. I'm so grateful to have a chance to meet Aaron. I'm so grateful I got to see Dale again. I'm so grateful Sharon Knight invited me. Any of those things, they've actually proven now with all the laptops that even this doesn't plan into your brain like writing does. And if you think back about all the times you've taken notes or in school or whatever, there's something about that process of writing. So I highly, highly recommend that. And I will tell you, my little basket, I will tell you back to the daily number what I think is the, an important impact. I don't always tell this, it depends on the group I'm talking to, but I'm a pretty positive person even with all this death that I dealt with. But my mother was manic depressive. So she was mentally ill. She finally got some medication later in life, but it was tough because she would, she would deal with this and uh, she later died of cancer as I mentioned. But there was one day, actually happened a lot, but I'm going to the University of Washington. She would call me and she'd shake her pills on the phone, before cell phones, and go, if you don't come over right now, I'm going to take all these pills and I'm going to kill myself. I'm like 16 and she did that for three or four years. And the reason I mention it is because I think I got some of that manic depressive crap from her. And it's tough. When you're a motivated, energetic person like I am, and people, oh, you're Mr. Leader, and you're the, I've been a pilot for a long time, and I used to be a national champion, hydroplane driver, done a bunch of crazy stuff, and you can't be depressed, but I got it from her. And because of what happened to Dana and many other friends, I'm just not going to take pills. I'm not saying that's not a reason why they can be done, but I just can't do it. But I wake up one day, and I'm a two. And I just felt terrible. This is about a year and a half ago. So I thought, okay, Mr. Gratitude Guy, what are you going to do? So I grabbed my gratitude journal and I went down to Starbucks and I took the five minutes, maybe a little few minutes longer, and I wrote in it. It made me feel better. I'm grateful for Connor. I'm grateful for Kyle. I'm grateful for my health. I never tell people what to write, but typically what I write number one is my health because without that, you don't seem to have much. I feel pretty lucky, pretty fortunate at 64 to be pretty healthy. But I wrote in and I came back home. I was like a four or a five. So I was better. But I still wasn't where I wanted to be, Mr. 8, 9, or 10. So I went up to Burlington, this chamber. It's a good chamber up in Burlington. Maybe 150 people. It's a good-sized group. I did my talk, and as I said, it's probably a year, year and a half ago. And so when I'm done, I'm at my table. People are over there. They're lining up, and I get to talk to them, and I get to hear stories. You know, they say that people would rather run through a mall naked than speak in front of a group. So there's a lot of people that don't want to speak in front of a group. But I get to hear a lot of these stories one-on-one. -on -one. People that will talk to me when it's just the two of us. This gal comes up. She's crying. She goes, um, my name is Janice. Can I give you a hug? And, of course, being single, you can imagine I'm always going to take a hug. And um, she says, you just changed my life. I went, wow. I said, can I ask what happened? And she says, I can't tell you because it's going to get me upset. But a couple of the stories that you said really impacted me and uh, it just means a lot to me and she got a journal and did a couple other things and I had met some other really nice people and I said well I don't know if I really changed your life 
I, I don't think that's the case. I think maybe I gave you a tool or tools or something or at least a way to look at things. Even that little card exercise, how people look at you. We look at people so critically. That's what gratitude will do for you. I see you as energetic and powerful the way that uh, Dale and Aaron saw each other. That's what gratitude do when we frame it because we live in a world pretty negative out there. So I went out to my car and the first thing I thought of is that if you ever wonder who your best friend is in life, who's the first person you call when you get really good or bad news? I, I think that's a candidate. So for me, it would have been Connor and then probably Kyle next, a little closer to my younger son. But I sat there and I thought, nope, I'm not going to call anybody. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy this. And I thought to myself, now I'm a nine. And I'd gone from a two to a four, five to a nine. I didn't take a pill. I didn't snort something. I didn't have a bottle of beer. I didn't have a cigarette. And I just noticed this impact, which is why I like to do that little exercise, whether you're writing on a card or writing in a gratitude journal, what a difference it can make. And as I mentioned, it's something I highly recommend. These same fraternity brothers I reference every so often. They call me, they're the ones that name me the Brooker. Because way back when, I need a dose of the Brooker because I've always been Mr. High Energy. So they'll call me. I need a dose of the Brooker. What's wrong? Well, I got so-and-so. I go, well, let me ask you something. Have you written in your gratitude journal yet? No. Okay, we'll do that and call me back. Because that's how big of an impact it can have. So we talk about, I mentioned the chamber. Having had this good fortune to manage as many people as I have, and whether you're an owner, a director, a manager, whatever position that you have, so many people when we have employees, they wonder why so many employees are goofy these days. They text each other, they don't show up for work. I can't imagine, I was here at like, I don't know, 10.30, I can't be late. I gotta be on time. Well, 30 years ago, the top three things employees wanted in a job were appreciation and recognition, help with personal problems, and being in on the know. That was the top three. And then wages and benefits and all these other things were down the list. That's all changed. They just did the same survey here about a year ago, 30 years later. I think appreciation and recognition is still a big part of it. But the number three thing, responsibility. The number two thing, goals. I talked to the students at the Kamiak about that last week, about goals. How important I think that is in life. But the runaway leader now is purpose. People want a purpose in life. So if you find the purpose that your employees are looking for, you're going to have a better employee. It's the better engagement. It's lower turnover. It's, it's increased productivity. What did I read one day? Uh, um, oh, where was it? I forget. It was something that somebody... Oh, hold on a second. It was such a funny thing. Uh, I have it. Here it is. Uh, a recent survey, 30% of the employees are engaged and inspired. 52% have a perpetual case of the Mondays. They're there but not present. And this is my favorite. 18% are actively disengaged, roaming the halls, spreading discontent. <laughs> so, when you, but you have to set the example yourself though. As I said, being a parent or a leader, manager, owner, or whatever. And I mentioned um, working for the Norsen family for quite a while. So I'm the gratitude guy, so I can't be negative or cynical. Plus, I videotape these and probably send the clip to Blake. Just kidding. But they did a great job of setting a really good example. The newer generation is a little bit different now. But, it's, but they did a great job. All those guys were on the floor. They were working hard, appreciating you as much, inviting you to the Seahawks games, whatever it might have been. They did a phenomenal job of that. And I really think when you increase somebody's purpose, their self-confidence, their ability to really want to do a job for themselves, not for you, you know, they say the value of an employee is the kind of job they do when they know nobody's looking, which I always heard. So, so I have a couple. Oh, I want to do one thing, too. Um, I want to give a book away. So before I wrap up and wrap up about five minutes, can you all grab your business cards? Hopefully you all have business cards. Because I want to give away a book. And Miss Erin, would you be kind enough to help me with this? And just take this around the room. Of course. And actually, I'm going to give away a gratitude journal. I used to give away books... The whole thing with the gratitude journal I tell people is if you get one, at least give it a week and try it. This is a book I've done called Happiness Starts with Gratitude. There's 50 stories in it. And so I'm just going to have you guys draw. And Oh, and by the way, I do send out a video on Monday. If you don't want the video, it's two minutes on gratitude, put an X on your card. I don't want anybody to get the video that doesn't want it. So if you're not interested, I, I don't... I would say I've been watching it every week since we met, and I love it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you. You get a free book for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me keep going. <laughs> 
Here's 20 bucks. <laughs> actually, speaking of which, so it was actually, gosh, I'm, my mind is, was it Aaron or Judy or Sharon? One of the three we were talking, I think it was Judy, about if you, get, if you do anything between now and the time you move on from this life, a lot of people, I've lost 20 to 25 people, I can name the names like that. My wife and my mom and my dad and all the people I talked about that their lives were very, very short. And I tell people, especially when I do the, the students or the commencements about find something you're passionate about before you leave this earth. And again, I, I just don't care how old you are. I, I had a grandfather that lived till 99 in Spokane and he practiced law till 97. i never forget it, two clients over in Spokane. So find something you're passionate about. But I was doing this drawing and it was a big group. This was about two, three, four months ago. And they, they, I, I call it Sally. And so it's Sally. So they all clap. Oh, Sally, great. She comes walking up to the stage. And I was up about a foot up. And I hand her the book. And I go, here you go, Sally. Congratulations. And she goes, oh, thanks. And then she's turning to walk away. I said, you know, later, if you'd like, I'll sign that for you. She goes, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, I said, you know what? I, I don't think I'm anything special, Sally. I'm just trying to, I'm, trying to, I'm not John Grisham or something. I'm just trying to make, make a difference here. Jim Baker. All right, right there. All right, thank you. Well, that was pretty tepid applause. Now, I will pay you $20. Have me sign that. So I just want to, I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes. I just want to review very briefly embracing gratitude. And I mean, I did mention this to a couple of the ladies I talked to when I get to do one and two hour workshops. I do a lot of exercises. There's nothing like exercises as opposed to a person that's just talking away and telling you whatever they're talking about. But this embracing gratitude is so powerful and you can see that with the three by five cards. Never give up, you either sort of make that choice or not. Kind of like happiness is a choice. That's why I love what John Lennon's mom told him. And this make room for gratitude, that's also a choice. Judy and I were talking about that. Or no, it was Aaron, sorry. And about this is a choice and people say, well, you know, anybody who starts a sentence with you don't understand always cracks me up. Because I have as good of a story as any and I haven't even told you half the other people that died to make my life one that's so tragic if I chose to. But I don't. I just don't think it's, it's a choice that I get to make. And so again, happiness is a choice. The gratitude journal. I think is so important. If you, if you write in a spiral, if you do something, people say, I think about it, that's fine, but there's something about writing it. And the last thing is if you'll notice in your life things you get really excited about, you want to share them. You want to tell people. People will call, hey, guess what I did? And how many times have you had a great experience in your life when you got to share it with somebody? So I would like to now ask how many people here, see what kind of honest group we have here, have been on their smartphone since I've been talking? Anybody? Anybody on their smartphones? One honest person. Okay, good. <laughs> Actually, I did this recently, and the guy goes, "Can I? Sh I should. I wrote. Get a gratitude journal." And he's like showing me his phone and stuff. <laughs> so I said, "Okay, okay." So I'd like you to all take out your phones. Sm whatever. If you have, if you don't have a phone, it's okay. But whoever has the phones, take your smartphones out. And those of you that don't, you may want to make a little note on a piece of paper. There might be some extra three by five cards because. This is called the four T's. T is in the letter T. And what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to give you one minute. And this is what I want you to do. If you don't have a phone, you can write on one of the cards. I want you to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody in the next 60 seconds how grateful you are to have them in your life. Go. And if you don't have a phone, just write it and give them that you can read it to them later. 60 seconds. Again, text, tweet. text, tweet, telephone, or tell. These actually have been used as telephones. It's quite a concept <laughs> at one time. And what was the last one? Text, tweet, telephone, or tell. Tell. Yeah, so you can tell somebody if they're sitting next to you. <laughs> God, I love this table over here. <laughs> this table cracks me up. <laughs> About 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, and stop. And if you're not finished, you can do it later. Uh, and when I was at the school, I gave them 30 seconds. And get this, the average number of texts was like four or five texts in 30 seconds. It was unbelievable. And I suggested them the person you may want to say you're for is the parents that were sitting right next to them at their, uh, at their graduation. Uh, and for those of you that don't have a phone or didn't bring it with you, if you wrote a note, just call somebody today, let them know, give them the note, and tell them how grateful you are for, uh, for having them in your life. Again, it's something I like to remind people of. These are just little reminders. I was doing, it wasn't at Kamiak, it was a performing arts center, and the, um, the, the, the seats kind of went up at a big angle like this, and I could see this gal kind of roughly where Aaron is, or Dale. And I could hear her talking. She was actually using this as a telephone, quite a concept. And uh, I'm guessing she was talking to her husband. She goes, I just want to let you know how grateful I am for you. Yes, honey, and I really love you. Mm hmm Yes, and I... I don't know, some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. And I, <laughs> no, it's supposed to be your idea. Don't tell him it was me. <laughs> and then another person said, I always get to talk to people afterwards, which is really my favorite part. Because again, they'll tell you stuff they're not going to say in front of a group. And the guy comes up to me and he shows, look at my text. And I see his text and he goes, I'm so grateful for you. And the wife puts back, what's up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exactly. And then there was another one very similar that was like, do you need money? You know? So it was pretty funny. So I just would encourage you to consider a gratitude journal. Consider remembering every single day, you know, with all this craziness that is going on in the news these days in schools and all this terrible stuff. You just never know what's going to happen. And I encourage people. I got up that morning expecting to find my wife right next to me, and that wasn't the case. And that was... 15 years ago and it feels like five minutes ago. And so when you remember gratitude and remember how to frame your life and then you realize that it takes as long as it takes and again I really urge people not to worry about how old they are. It's because all our time is, our journey is individual. And I think the gratitude journal and the final thing is on sharing gratitude. There's something about sharing gratitude that is, makes it so much more fulfilling. That's why I like to do that little text exercise. And I know years ago I was uh, I never did drugs and I never did smoke or all that kind of nonsense, but I was always kind of an adrenaline guy. I learned how to fly and jumped out of airplanes and things like that and bungee jumped. And so I told all these same fraternity brothers, we're going skydiving. So they're all raising their hand, we're in. So I make a reservation for eight at Issaquah skydiving on the following Saturday, about a week ahead of time, because you need to make about a week out. So on Monday or Tuesday, I notice a couple of them call me. They can't make it. Yeah. And then we get to Wednesday. This is David. <coughs> Dave, I got a sore throat. Looks like I won't make Saturday. And I get to Friday. There's two or three left. And I walk up to Issaquah skydiving Saturday about 10 a.m. And I walk proudly up to the counter. And I go, Brooke, party of eight for skydiving. And the guy looks at me and he goes, where are all your friends? And I said, I don't have any. And nobody showed up. And I went by myself. And I got a little picture of me jumping out of the airplane and all that kind of stuff. And that's all just super. But it wasn't nearly as much fun if I hadn't been able to share it with those guys. And then some of them, they look at that picture. I said, oh, I remember that dad had a sore throat. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so... I would ask you, oh, and one last thing too, is I love referrals. I put some business cards on, my, uh, on the tables there if you get one. It's just the broker at thebroker.com. I love to speak to groups. Uh, I was talking to Judy about even groups, sometimes down to 10 or 12 people. I do nursing homes, and I keep pretty busy. I do two or three a week, but it's just thrilling to me to pursue a journey which started when I was 19 when I said I was going to be a speaker. And it took me 42 years to actually decide I was finally going to start to do it and leave Nordstrom and Lowe's and all the places I ran. So I highly encourage people to consider gratitude as a great coping mechanism. I feel I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for embracing gratitude. It's a phenomenally healthy coping mechanism in a world of so many negative, deadly ones. It changed and saved my life, and it can save yours too. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Judy. It's, uh, it's funny, you know, we talked about your, um, your academic